This is Duke University. Welcome to the Distinguished Speaker Series. Please take a moment to silence your cell phones and any other devices. This evening, we are fortunate to welcome Ursula Burns, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Xerox to the Fuqua School of Business. Ursula is a true leader of consequence, as we like to say, who originally joined Xerox as a summer intern 35 years ago and rose to become the first African-American female CEO of a Fortune 500 company. A native of New York City's Lower East Side, Ursula earned degrees in mechanical engineering from both NYU Polytechnic and Columbia. Her rise through the Xerox ranks includes nearly every aspect of the company, product development and manufacturing, supply chain operations and R&D, marketing and distribution, domestic and global. Long and best known for, a, for its success in document technology, Xerox is now expanding into new spaces by leveraging services, technology, and consulting expertise. Under Ursula's leadership, Xerox's revenues in business, processing, business process outsourcing and IT are now larger than those from its document technology business. In addition to leading the Xerox board as chairman, Ursula serves on the boards of directors of American Express, ExxonMobil, and the Ford Foundation. In 2010, President Barack Obama appointed Ursula Vice Chair of the President's Export Council. She also provides counsel to a number of community, education, and nonprofit organizations with a focus on improving the U.S. education system in science, technology, engineering, and math. It is an honor to have Ursula with us today, and there will be an opportunity for audience questions following the moderated portion of the hour. Please join me in giving a warm Team Fuqua welcome to Ursula Burns. So it's such a privilege for our community to, to welcome you here. I see, you roll, I see you roll in your yeah, eyes. Like, but, really? um, that, so, that intro was like twice as long as what's allowed. But. <laughs> OK. So I, I want to frame our conversation with two quotes. And the first quote is from you. And, uh, and what you said is, the accolades I get for doing absolutely nothing are amazing. <laughs> and the second quote that I want to make reference to is something that your mother told you, which is, where you are is not who you are. And so in our conversation, I want to focus on and who you are and, and what you've done rather than, than where you are. And so let's start with who is the single biggest influence on you in terms of who you are as a person and a leader? You know, it's, it always sounds, whenever I hear this question and I give the answer, it sounds real hokey. You know, like my mother. My mother was, um, I, I was, I was raised in an environment that most people would consider one that would be improbable or more than improbable, impossible to actually rise up out of to success. And I don't mean success in, in work, but success in spirit and you know, dreaming, et cetera. My mother, um, we were really poor. Uh, my mother was single parent. We had, was, there were three of us and her, and she, made, she had zero money, and we lived in a really bad neighborhood, bad place physically unsafe, um, just really a bad, visually un, you know, unappealing. And my mother did not get stuck on any of that. It, it, she almost, it didn't, it appeared to me that she lived somewhere else. Because she actually believed in her head that she had great opportunity to, to create a life and a future for that was amazing for, for these three children. And she didn't get wrapped up in the no money and you know, you're black or poor, you know, really bad neighborhood, gangs, drugs. It was, not, it was not important to her. What was important to her was our education and our value set. And every single conversation that I had with my mother in, my, in her life, she died when I was 25 years old, so she was 49. Every single conversation that I can remember had, was all around, 
what I control. So, you know, if I complained about something, he would say, so what part of this statement do you have, do you control? Can you affect? And that's one. And the second thing is, so how are you behaving? How are you acting? If you, you said something that she wouldn't, she said it a little differently. You know, prepare, being, prepare your life and decisions and everything that you do projected on a big screen, would you be proud of it? And if it was on your tombstone, would you be proud of it? You know, that, that act, that thing. Knowing that, obviously, I'm not a saint, you know, and nor was she, uh, surely, but that we should actually strive for this ideal, which is a good life, that's a, a reasonably good life. And so she was the most important person in my life, and to this day she is, and she's been dead for 25 years or so. And it's primarily because, more than that, she's been dead for more than that, yeah, almost 30 years. Primarily because she did with nothing what I'm trying to recreate with everything, and it's, it's hard. So you realize just how great she was, right? I, had, I, had, I have two kids, and I try to raise them with this, with this expansive view of positive, uh, expansive positive view of possibilities. And we have everything, and it's hard to do. And you realize that she did that with three kids with nothing. And so she's the most important person in yeah. my life. So, so she was the first mentor, leader, role model. When, when you try to, when you clearly think about her all the time, what do you think made her so good at, as a, as a yeah. leader and a mentor and, and a role model for you? Clarity. My mother, she was very simple and extremely clear. I remember my mother used to tell me that um, in her eyes, the world could be black and white. Because I always, always say, you know, it's more complicated than that, Mom. It's, you know. She said, you know, killing is bad, not killing is good. <laughs> you know, there's a whole bunch of conversations about, you know, under what conditions you do things and what would make things acceptable. And she says, you have to kind of enter, mo this is her life, enter most situations with a set of clarity. She did. That was amazing. And her thing was that we had a, a large amount of control of, of our life and our outcomes. There's a lot of stuff that's in front of you, and you're going to have to you know, figure out your way around and all this stuff. But you have a lot more control than you think, and so you should actually walk in with this idea that you have a lot of control. That's one. And the second thing she always said is that, you know, stop complaining about this, the today and the here and the now and where we are, and it's really poor. That doesn't define at all who you are. So just because we are unable to buy the newest clothes and we sometimes look poor does not mean you should act poor. And she was on this all the time. And there's a way to act poor. And by the way, most of the rich people that you see on TV act poor, right? I mean, they act poorly, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so she was trying to make that distinction and said that, that that's the part that's the most important part. It's not this other stuff. By the way, she also had, and we had a sign in, in our house that said, poverty sucks. So she's, this is not like, let's, let's shoot, shoot for poverty, because she also didn't think that was a good outcome. But um, it, was more about, it was more about you control a lot of your life. You, goodness is clear. And, and conversely, badness is clear. There's a lot of stuff, but goodness is clear and badness is clear. And we want to kind of lean toward this end of the spectrum, not towards that end of the spectrum. And the measure of your success is not going to be, at the end of the day, how, wh how much money you make. She said to me, who you are is not where you are, and you didn't read the second part. Remember that when you're rich and famous. This was, in, this was before there was any prospect of me being either rich or famous. And she, literally, because I was not even in college at the time. And we lived in a place that you would never expect anybody to be rich and famous from, unless they were like criminals. <laughs> <laughs> and she said to me, she would say, who you are is not where you are. Remember that when you're rich and famous. And I remember very specifically the first time that I recalled in real life, you know, versus just a proverb in the back of my head, that statement was when I was made president of the company. Um, it was a massive deal. I was made president and, and named to the board. It was huge. And I got calls from everywhere, and that's where this other statement. And I got called the smartest, the most attractive. Um, <laughs> everything, every accolade you could possibly imagine, was, I was called. He's a great person, great strategist, great decision maker, great. And I, I sat there and said, you know, this is my mother's, 
is kind of in the back going ping, ping, ping. Remember that when you're rich and famous, right? So where you are now is these people think you're this great person. You've done nothing yet. You know, I've just earned my way into the court to be debated, you know, for, that, for those greatnesses to be debated about me. But they've already kind of gave, given it to you. Be, be careful, right? Be careful. Because, and so it's, it was, I, when I was growing up, I thought it was kind of a whole bunch of BS. You know, do I have to hear this every single day, Mom? Every day? And now I say, I hear, I hear it every day. And she doesn't even have to say it to me, because I say it to myself every single day. You know? yeah. Yeah. So as you moved into your, your professional career, how important has mentoring been to you in terms of your development and, and in terms of advice to the people in the audience? How do you find those mentors? Yeah, it's probably this. This is another thing I didn't know until much later in my life. And when you look back, you look in hindsight and say, oh my god, wow, I didn't know that. It's probably the single most important piece of actual learnings that I got came from people who cared about me and spent time with me. Because I was taught, I'm an engineer, so I went to school and I learned how to do engineering, mechanical engineering. I was really good at it, everything was fine. You put me in the lab, I can do a set of equations and I can figure out a way to make things spin fast and whatever I was doing at the time. But what you find out early in, your li in life and in your career is that you can do very little by yourself. You can do very, so you have to actually engage the rest of the world. For engineers and for scientists, this is a little bit unfortunate, right? Because we kind of think it's, you know, math is pretty finite. I like it. One plus one under all circumstances is two. It's never 2.1 or, you know, a little bit better if you say it than I say it. And I like that, per that, that finality and that clarity um, of things. What you learn and what mentors have taught me throughout my career is that all, you have to be able to operate in the gray space. You have to be able to manage with people. I always say, I say a lot, that one of the toughest things about work is that humans are involved. Yeah. It would be great if it was just a set of machines, right? They come to work, they don't have sick kids, they don't get tired, the weather's not bad, et cetera, et cetera. They're not distracted. The most exciting thing about work is that humans are involved. Because literally what keeps the place going and what keeps creativity coming and new problems being identified and solved is that there are these people who kind of run around and they are not organized. They're not, they don't follow the script that you wrote. And that them, by not following the script that you wrote, they literally create new opportunities for businesses to grow and thrive, but for individuals to grow and thrive as well. So it's, yeah, it's a... So following up on this engineering background, um, how, how has that engineering training informed your leadership style? It is the foundation. I, I actually have to, I have to, it is who I am. My engineering thinking, I, you know, I happened on the perfect <laughs> career for me, the perfect career training choice for me. I am, a, as I said, I like black and white things, I like clarity, I like, you know, problems, solve them, and then you perfect them later. Let's just figure out a way to get ourselves out of the corner, and then you can perfect it later. That's what engineers do, right, Dave? And so, I, it's perfect choice for me. It, it's kind of the personality that I have. I don't, however that came about, my mother, however it came about, I have this, I like clarity. And I like to know the end of movies before I go in, to ask my kids. <laughs> By the way, I do all movies. I do not walk into movies that I don't know the end of the movie. Because I don't need to stress. Mean, why do you need to stress? I <laughs> So, you know, these suspense things, I'm not too into. So it's perfect for me. The career I chose is perfect for me. What mentors have done, and what most of my learning is, is in how to deal with the real world, which is mostly movies without knowing the ending. And, that, and so mentors, team members, the rest of the world helps me to fit into the world in an appropriate way. If it were just left up to me, most things would... It, we would not be as creative as we should be. Right? So yeah. I would just want to know the simple solution. So, so given that, that people kind of get in the way of things, that the mentors help that light bulb go on for you, that you, you could actually lead people? Yeah, and teaching me how. Not by saying it, but by doing it. By, uh, you know, you, you watch great leaders, of which I'm not one yet. You watch great leaders, and you are just mesmerized by their ability to create followership. Their ability to, to not, this is not like Houdini, like, you know, Svengali, it's not that. It's literally to work the room 
over a long time to, you know, weed out, but also, but not, not you know, select out, but, you know, weed out nonconformists in the worst way, bring in a lot of nonconformists in the best way, and create an arrow that people can kind of walk down. So there, you know, there are going to be people who break off to the side, but the vast majority of people are going to be on this path towards greatness, or, and they're going to use most of their energy towards moving the ball forward. The greatest leaders can do that. And that's, what, that's something that I spend a lot of time looking at. Mm -hmm. People, I select my boards for that. I select, I'm asked to go on all kinds of boards and all, do all kinds of things. And people say, well, why did you pick this company and that company? Primarily, I picked American Express and ExxonMobil because they have amazing leaders. These guys are, they are clear and human and um, fallible and they learn and they tell stories over and over and over again that cause people to align around a cause. And that's, and that's the, I think, the highest level of leadership that you can have. Mm -hmm. You've called yourself chief storyteller. So can you, can you tell us some stories, maybe the, the saddest story you know that, mm -hmm. that is a cautionary tale that, that you use to keep from repeating mistakes, and maybe a story about something that inspires you and you hope others? Most of my sad stories are personal stories. There are very few things in business that make me really sad. <laughs> now, I have, I, I, I got a, excuse, I have a board member here, so he's a boss of mine. So I'm, I'm a little nervous about having him hear all my, more, my secret well, he's, stuff. So he's my board member too. So, uh, yeah, so Bob, <laughs> just be kind. I'm yeah. very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I say that in a very serious way. There are very few things that happen in business that I care about, about that much that I would divert my emotional <coughs> sadnesses toward. If I, so most of my sadnesses are, have to do, my sad occasions that are memorable have to do with things that I missed with people, individuals. When my, when my mother died, the most heartbreaking, the saddest, the most amazing thing in my life was when my mother died. Very young, very unexpected, and I was unprepared. And so the, the conversations that you would have if you knew something was happen, happening was very different than if you didn't know, right? Mm -hmm. So I didn't know. I kind of knew she got sick, but still didn't know she was dying. So I missed a whole set of opportunities to tell her what I'm telling people now about how important she was to me. Business is not that way for me. It's a little bit more, I'm, a, I'm the caretaker of a legacy that we want to keep going for a long, that we want to keep creating every single day. I'm just one of many, many, many of those caretakers. There are things I'm very passionate about business, but I'm not, I don't lose emotional, you know, it's not the whole part of my life mm -hmm. <laughs> at all. Mm -hmm. Most of the joys that I have are also personal, but I can tell you some unbelievable uh, work joys. Uh, so most of the sadnesses are personal. Mm -hmm. Most of the joys mm -hmm. are, are mixed. You know, one of the things that was amazing was when I, when the company decided to buy this other company. And I remember we were, I was thinking about this. I had two years of being president before I became CEO. And we knew that the, the CEO then knew we were kind of stuck a little bit if we didn't do something fundamentally different with the, with the assets that we had. We had a lot of them. Great um, research institutions spread around the world. Unbelievable people. You know, really customer centric and problem solvers. Dealing with complexity very well. You know, push through any wall, amazing group, set of people that are part of the Xerox family. Permission by, by clients to do stuff. That, and customers liked us. And they actually wanted us to succeed, even if we screwed up. They, they were willing to kind of hang out with us for a while. So we had this brand that people liked. And the question was, what do you do with it? Right? If you are in a business that, that is changing, not by anything that you did, and changing for the better, what you, the, the service that you provide is changing fundamentally for the better. You don't have to print all of this stuff. You can, you can view it. You, everything was changing. And it would change our business very substantially. And we, I had time, and the company had a little bit of foresight to think about, what do you do? We could fight this. And we, there's a company that did, and it, you know, it's not doing too well right now. It's uh, actually almost out of business. Literally, 
companies that do that, we had the benefit and the foresight to think about what else could we do. And one of the most amazing times was when we went to a bank, myself and my CFO thought about buying this other company for more money than we had during the banking crisis, where nobody else had money either. But at least the company that we were buying didn't have a lot of suitors because nobody had money. Right? So it was like the perfect time to buy because nobody else was shopping and we were shopping and a little bit desperate uh, from, a, from a future perspective. And we went to the bank to J.P. Morgan Chase. And Jamie Dimon is the head of J.P. Morgan Chase. And he's you know, reputed to be a lot of things. One of the things that he is, that he's reputed to be, is smart. And he is pretty smart. Uh, we sat with him, and he said to me, so Ursula, here's the, here's the deal. Um, we can get you money. Um, other people could probably get you money, too. Uh, but the reason why you're going to come with us is, is because I believe this is the smartest move that I've seen in years. And that was one of the few times that I said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow, this is a guy who is smart. And he... Uh, so these, these kind of, those, you get some joy in that, some personal mm -hmm. joy. Mm -hmm. Also, a lot of joy when, we, when you actually have groups of people who solve big, big problems on your, you know, for the company, or customers call you and say that more often than not that you screwed something up, but you fixed it, because that's generally what happens. If you just do it right the first time, they don't generally call you. Um, but if you, if you mess it up, or somebody messes up and you fix it, those are, those are happy times in, in the company. Yeah. Yeah. My two kids being born, joyful times. Yeah. My two kids getting into college, joyful times. My two kids getting into graduate school, joyful times. Uh, most of the joyful times and the sad times, as I said, are, are, are personal things, not yeah. too much uh, yeah. work stuff. So uh, moving to some, some different kinds of behaviors and emotions, you talk a lot about the need to be fearless. And, and you also have said that you sometimes think that Xerox suffers from terminal niceness. Now, what's interesting is that there are two really pivotal, pivotal moments in your career where you openly challenge some senior leaders, and, uh, and instead of being reprimanded or fired, you were offered new jobs and promotions. Yeah. So the, the question is, what, what can you tell people around how you approach things without fear and that, that you have the candor and the honesty but you say things in a way that people find engaging rather than off-putting. Yeah, the second part, let me start with that. That's where mentors help a lot. They helped me a lot um, to help me understand how to deliver messages that people could hear the message versus the way I was saying the message. That's, that's an art form that I'm still working on. Yeah. Um, but I got a lot of help on it because I was significantly worse at it when I was younger than I am today. Because how you say things actually is important. I used to think it was only what you said. It's the one plus one is two. You know, why, why do we have to debate about anything else? But it is important to actually make it such that people can actually not put up barriers and hear the, the words, the actual words. Mentors have helped me a lot on that. It helped me a lot on how I speak and not the pace or the diction, but the, the gentleness or the harshness under, you know, under which you you say things. I'm still working on that. My team, my direct team, helps me a lot in this, in this area. Beth, who's here, where's Beth? She's the brunt of the most, she's the brunt of the worst of Ursula Burns. So, <laughs> what I mean by that is that part, I have good thoughts. We all have good thoughts. And if you don't check yourself before you open your mouth, sometimes you say what you feel and before you say what you think. You know, so I'm annoyed will be the first words, but the question, you know, I'm, I'm annoyed. And you, but what, it's a teaching moment, so why don't you just go to the teaching and not go to the annoyed moment? So a, a lot of, a lot, that, 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 what I just said is open for a lot more deep diving, but mentors help me a lot, and people who are patient with me help me a lot to kind of balance out a conversation so that I can be heard and my voice so that I can be heard versus, you know, be off-putting. But what I found out, and one of the things that's really shocking to me is, throughout my career, has been shocking throughout my career, whenever I run into it, which is often, is that very well-educated, broad, flexible, meaning the option, people with options, work hard to not offend or to be 
I'm gonna, to be, um, to, to conform. And I think that there is a balance between not offending, of course, as I said, I'm still working on it, but people work so hard on it that their voice gets totally and completely shut down. So you sit in a room, one of the things at Xerox that, I, that really shocked me is we would sit in rooms of, and we would listen to a presentation and people would say, oh yeah, nice presentation, great slides, this was beautiful, well done, John, really beautiful. John would leave the room and we would say, we're never gonna do that, that was the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> so I say, well, the presentation was nicely done, the slides were nicely done, but wouldn't it have been useful for John to understand, because he had some kernel of a good idea, wouldn't it have been useful for him to understand, if we could have said it without saying the stupidest thing in my life, right? Wouldn't it have been useful for him to understand that that was not very useful? <laughs> that what he was doing was not something that we wanted him to do, continue to do. And we, we always felt as though, and I think companies do generally, they don't want to actually insult people. And there is a good thing. I don't, everybody don't run around thinking that I insult people all day. I don't do that. But I think that we also actually tolerate from people who can do better and should be able to do better, who are in this small group of very gifted, well-trained, high expectation people, we tolerate averageness. And it's not just averageness of intelligence, it's of behavior and just, and I don't think it's necessary. I think we can actually step above that, particularly if you're close to each other, particularly if you all know each other. The ramifications around my team leadership table is what, what, is the, what are the ramifications? I'm gonna fire them? No, I actually depend on them unbelievably, right? So I wanna be able to have a conversation where they say to me, Ursula, that idea that you just said, or that the way that you approach that is just not gonna fly. It's just not good, however they wanna say it. I want them to be able to say it versus worry about ramifications of saying it if it's the right, you know, if, it, if it's just not stupid. If it's stupid, then we, then we start to do education kind of things. <laughs> but what happens is that I find so often people are more cautious. I spend, I go to Washington a lot. A lot more than I thought I would ever do as a, as a business leader. By the way, necessarily, importantly, it's, it's required. You probably know this. Policy is made, and if you don't give them some insight about the effects of the proposed policy, then you live with it, so you better have some voice. I go to Washington, you go, and, you, and I have the privilege to sometimes sit with the president. And one of the things that's really interesting is people say to me, I am just amazed that you would, you would actually speak to the president that way. And I say, oh, was I, you know, was I unkind? Oh, no, no, no. Was I, did I ins say something, did I insult? No, no, no. You just didn't agree with him. <laughs> and I say, I say, I say this to my team when I come home, he asked me to the office to, to talk to him, and I would assume that what he wanted was my opinion, not his opinion told back to him, right? <laughs> and so this idea that, that we have to, we have a responsibility to use our brains to move causes forward for the better is something that I think we're losing a little bit of with this terminal, you know, politically correct, very nice. So we spend so much time on that that, we, that the words become hard to say. You know, it, it, it gets confused. And in your family, the one thing you can count on in your family is that after you say something really bad to your husband or your children, let's say your children, they love you anyway. Right? And so you try not to say it often, but you have to be comfortable enough to say, yeah, you know, I'm really not happy today. I'm really pissed off today, and this is what you did. And they have to be able to come back and say, I think you're unjustified or justified in that, and have a real conversation back and forth. And Xerox, we're te I'm teaching that a little bit. Mm -hmm. We're terminally nice, and we're getting less nice. That doesn't mean that we're mean. We're getting more um, able to have frank conversations about good things and bad things, where we have to improve, what business types we want to go into, whether this person is going to be successful, whether this strategy makes sense. Those are conversations that we have to have openly and not with, without fear of reprisal. Yeah. Well, you're, you're, you can't afford either mediocrity or a lack of candor because you are leading a major transformation at Xerox. And so it's a, it's a huge amount of change. And maybe people don't know that you've transformed the company from one that was a product technology company to one that is now, the larger percentage of the company is uh, a service, a service process uh, business. 
So was that transformation hard for you personally, given your mechanical engineering background, or did you feel like you had the same? Not, not hard for me personally. No. Yeah. I think the, the discipline of, of um, the, dis the thing about process, I love the word process because it's kind of like the middle name of engineers, right? Um, and so first, first lay it out and then figure out a way to uh, perfect it and then lean it out, right? Um, but the reason why it wasn't, by the time we made that transition, it was more, my job was more about um, leading than managing anything. I, 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 we were talking about this a little bit earlier in the lunch. I manage very few things, right? I, I don't do a lot. I don't hire a lot of people anymore. I, don't, I fire hardly anyone. Um, I lead a lot of people who actually also lead things. And so by the time we made that, that transition, that, by the time that transition was you know, well underway, which I was the leader of and starter of, I didn't have to get too far into the details of managing the things. It was more about orchestrating a set of changes. I think that if I were still an engineer and somebody told me, you know, doing engineering, that we were, you know, going to now do, I don't know what the heck, business process outsourcing, it would have been a little confusing. And so I do spend time actually trying to yeah. make sure that people understand the change, but for me now it's not, it's really not a big deal. So the, one of the leadership challenges with that transformation is that the growth is on the service side and, and you don't see the growth on the technology side, but you can't afford to have too, too little activity on the technology side as yeah, you're in that it's transition. it's really interesting. So how do, you, how do you motivate the people who are on the side of the business that doesn't yeah, see yeah. the same upside? Yeah, it sees the same, it sees upside, but different upside. So what, how do you motivate them? You gotta show them their upside. The upside in our company is different for the two, for the two different types, of, for the many different types of businesses that we're in. It's not only just technology, and services, parts of services that are declining as well or, or have a different economic model or economic dynamic that we have to pay attention to. But your question is actually one of the most challenging things that I'm dealing with today. One of the, you know, we bought this company, we changed, we're, you know, we're still struggling our way through bringing in all of these people and, you know, understanding the real details of some of the business that we have. That's all good fun, you know, that's what work is about. Part of the, Thing that I was not prepared for was how much conversation I had to have with the people who were on the technology side about whether or not we still love them. Hmm. So literally, the vast majority of time that I spend on technology with the, with the people in the company who were historic Xerox people, 90% of the time is on the we still love you hmm. time. And it's, and you know, my team will tell you, I was so frustrated with this conversation because I would say, I've already made it clear that we love you. So do you want me to say it every single day? You, uh, you know, even when I'm speaking on earnings calls, by the way, we love the technology guys. Because what happens is everything is accessible to everyone. So they read something that you do in earnings and they say, well, you didn't say that, you didn't mention that we love the technology guys. I'm like, well. So part of what I had to do was become a little, this is my, this is the engineer part or the, I don't know, what, it's not the, it's more than engineer, so it's the personality part of, isn't it clear? I said it, I meant it. Do I have to say it every single time? My kids teach me that, yes, you have to say it every single time, but <laughs> because they actually need to be reassured that it's not it, that their jobs are still valuable to the company, that their value is still useful to the company. And that's what, it, and, it's, and it becomes extremely personal. It's, you know, the group, but it, what it comes down to is that I, it's not am I going to have a job only, but is, is it worthwhile for me to be here? And that's something that I miscalculated, underestimated, how important it was to actually have that conversation, tell that story continuously in many different languages and many different you know, ways of telling the story. It's a continuous thing, and we bought the company six years ago. And I'm still, I open up most conversations with technology guys, you're very valuable. It sounds a little bit rote now, but because it's true, they are very valuable. I mean, they're parts of that business that are growing. Every single person in technology contributes disproportionately to the success of the company today and the people in services. They overachieve on just about everything that we give them to do. We're experts at it, so, and we're still learning on the other side. So they cover a lot of sins of the other side. They are extremely valuable individuals groups and as a section of the business. And I underestimated how important it was to continue to say that. Mm -hmm. And 
this is another leadership thing. Yeah. Some of my board helps me with this, the soft side. Yeah. So, so you've said that women are different, and, are. That, and that differences Did should be- Did you know that? Everybody know that? <laughs> and that differences should be celebrated. Absolutely. So do those differences carry over into how you think about leadership? Absolutely. Absolutely. By the way, I don't know a lot about how men think about leadership in, from the inside out, obviously. But I, I've lived with it for my whole life, because most of the leaders that I've worked for are men. You know, I, one of the reasons why I say this is that there was a time, I have a son and a daughter. And the son is the most interesting one. The, do, the daughter is the most challenging one. The son is the most interesting one. And the son is, he's, we spent a lot of time together. He would, he would say things to me like, you know, I don't know whether I should hold the door open for this woman or not, because you know, sometimes they're confusing. And by the way, some of the statements were that basic. You know, I held the door open and the woman was insulted and so on and so forth. We actually have created this, we women, have created this unbelievable situation for the world. We said, we are different, but we, wanted, but we want to not be different. We want you to pretend as though we are not different except for when it's convenient for us to be different. <laughs> and, and we're not even gonna tell you when, you should know when. <laughs> now, it's funny, but it's really kind of, it's nerve wracking because women are different. Still today, the only people who can have the babies are the women. So I don't care what you say, for nine months of your life, or you know, plus or minus a month, you will have you will have a physical you will be physically burdened for nine months of your life. Men will never experience that. When you walk into work in that state, things are different for you. You will have to be treated differently. Now, that doesn't physically differently. That doesn't mean your mind has gone away or that you you know that not that. But it's trust me that you can't do the same thing. You, you're not gonna be able to jump off the fourth story. You know, you're not gonna be able to do that. We've actually confused things. We've actually swung the, this is my opinion, so everything is my opinion. This one is definitely my opinion. <laughs> we actually have swung things over to the far, I think too far. The things that we celebrate, the things that we should celebrate about being a woman, often we are trying as women to push back and to kind of make it not important. It's really not a big deal. Yes, I know I'm pregnant, but the fact of the matter is, yes, you're pregnant and. It's not but, it's and. The, things are changing for the next couple of, by the way, when I come back to work, I'll be fine, I'll be, yeah. But when I come back to work, guess what, we'll have a baby, the two of us, and things will change. When you have a baby, if things don't change, then I'm wondering what the heck are you doing? <laughs> so I just think, I think what has happened is that we've actually taken all the nuance and the beauty out of difference by trying to drive this, no, don't hold the door for me, I mean, how dare you give up your seat? I say to my son, you give up your seat. I don't care what the hell the woman looks like, pregnant or not, old or young, offer her your seat. That has nothing to do with whether I think she's weak or strong at all. It's a value that we've carried in our family, and I don't, I'm not willing to crush that value, right? So, it, I just think we have to kind of loosen up a little bit and actually focus on the most important things. We have a mind that is equal to a man's mind. We, have, we don't have generally physical capability that are equal it, from a strength perspective. I'm okay with that. <laughs> so therefore, the men should carry more stuff than I do. <laughs> I'm making a joke out of it, but I hope that you get what I mean. This is, it's not about women are, are, are stronger or weaker or, or smarter. Or, we're different. Different things, that we're stronger at certain things that men can't be stronger at. We can actually have a baby. We actually are still, prim the primary responsibility of a young child, the primary responsibility for a young child is with the mother. Uh, by the way, all kinds of variations of that are, cr are, being, crop are create being created. I'm, f I'm fine with that. Until they're in place, guess what? If the baby has to be fed and you don't have formula, there's only one person who can do that. And that means that the person who has to be prepared to do it, does it, right? The woman has to be prepared to take care of that responsibility or else why have the, the child? Now, we have to have a society that works on a set of structures, companies, 
uh, government structures, schools, whatever, that works on a set of structures that, that kind of even that out for women. But until it's done, until it's evened out, you're going to be fighting a cause. I'm fine with that, because I fight them all the time. Be prepared that you're fighting for the next generation, because you're probably not going to benefit that much from it today. But that's part of what life is like. That's what we do. I just, I just don't think we can throw away the differences without be, being prepared for the ramifications. Mm -hmm. And one of the ramifications is that we have children, we have families, we, we create um, institutions that go on for a long time. And I kind of like men to be men, to look like men and to operate like men, and women to operate like women. And by the way, if you're gay or transgendered, you like whatever you like, but that sh we should allow that, those differences to be celebrated, not to try to hom homogenize ourselves to one, mm -hmm. which is, seems like what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. That gets me really nervous. Yeah. So shifting to uh, yeah, he's another. Like, Let's move off this subject. <laughs> no, I... he's like, we are done. <laughs> I'm fine, I'm fine. So I, I actually, I wanted to uh, bring another group into the spotlight here. Uh, so another group you're, you're a part of, which is business. And you have said that there is an unhealthy distrust of business. Oh, yeah. So what, what, what have we done collectively to create that distrust, and what can we do to, to bring trust back into the, the world of business? You know, I, I, this is, so I know we're on some thing, right, taped. <laughs> so I'm, <laughs> I'm going to caveat this with, the fact that anybody who I insult or, or get angry has to understand that this is my opinion. I, I run a company, and unfortunately, I don't run it by my opinion. Uh, so I think that we, in the last couple of iterations of global elections, global policy setting, we've created a, a way of winning by creating losers. So what we've said is um, there are people who have a lot of stuff. There are this many. And there are people who have few, a little bit of stuff, and there are more. And the people who have a lot of stuff is the cause for your having a little bit of stuff. They are the enemy. They're small in number, so it doesn't particularly matter, because they can't really vote more. Than, they're a small in number, and those are the, that's the, the, the cause of all of, the, all of your unhappiness and unsuccess, whatever it is, is, are those guys over there. Business has become, particularly big business has become that. Really? I, whenever I go to Washington, I'm like, are you serious? I, I employ 140,000 people. So what are we talking about? The, are you talking to the 140,000 people? Or are you just talking to this building? Because the business is nothing but a whole bunch of people. And there's this disproportionate view that these leaders, me, Bob Keegan in his old life, whoever it is, you who run the business school, you run, this, I run Xerox so that I can get the last penny out of my workers, pay them the least amount of money, give them the least amount of health care, literally so I can keep it all for myself. Really? I, it's just not so. We just don't wake up thinking that way. We don't go to sleep thinking that way. It never enters our mind. Never. And by the way, if you listen, listen, you would say to yourself, my God, CEOs, who would want to be one of those? They're worse than the president, worse than Congress. They're worse than lawyers, right? Um, <laughs> because we've been vilified. I mean, by the way, I'm not, I don't think that we need a lot of people defending us. That, uh, but I just think it's unhealthy. It's unhealthy. The world runs by a whole bunch of people doing different things. Not-for-profit do not-for-profit things. Organizations like churches do their piece. Governments do their piece. Businesses, big and small, do their piece. There is no part of the groups that I just talked about, including armies, that, ha that are inherently bad. We just make them bad when you actually have a zero-sum game that you lay out for your citizens. And I think that often what happens, particularly now in politics, it's a zero-sum game. The only way that we're going to actually be able to have you people out there happier is by taking it away from the people who have more. By the way, I think that there's a fair amount of that that has to be done, which is called a tax system, which the last time I looked at, 
was pretty hefty amount of taxes that we pay, corporations and individuals, at least that I pay, and my company pays, corporations and, and businesses. So we're not sitting there all kind of taking the money and saying, yeah, these guys don't deserve it, whatever. But there's a way to do that legally. Government should structure a system that does that legally, and you know, put tariffs on things. And, and then everybody should go off and play their games by the rules of a good, organized, um, well-meaning society, and not pit people against each other. And right now, I think in, it's really dangerous what's happening in the view and the voice about, about corporate America. By the way, the view and the voice about banking is the worst of all. I mean, so banks are the leaders, they're the, they're the devil incarnate in business, and then businesses are the little, whatever the, the angels. Acolytes. The acolytes. Right. And I just think, I think it's inappropriate. I think that what, you know, this, this world was built, there are bad actors everywhere, in everything, government everywhere, um, and, and in business, there are bad acting businesses, there are bad acting individuals in business, I, I, that's, all, that's why we have laws, that's why we have, you know governance structure, but business is absolutely fundamental to successful society. Big business, for sure, but so is medium size, medium size and small. And we've actually created this, this voice around them that they are, they are inherently bad. And inher the leaders, not personal, but the leaders, are inherently greedy and blood-sucking individuals. And I think it's just not true. Yeah. It's not healthy. Okay, I'm gonna ask one last question and then turn it over to the audience. And, um, and I think maybe this question I should ask of the audience because uh, when, I, when I started off with a quote from your mother, um, you reminded me that there's more to that. And, and what I'd written down was, don't get confused when you get rich and famous. And so I guess the question for the audience is, do you think she's doing okay here? <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, do, you, do you still think about that? All the time, all the time, I, you know, all the time. You know, I said this earlier, and it's, it's so, so hokey when you say it sometimes, but I, I say it all the time because it, it actually is true. There is a point in life when the next million dollars or $10,000 or five doesn't make a difference. It comes earlier than you think. The first time that you have, you're faced with a loved one struggling or a massive success that has nothing to do with money, you realize that all of the joy, all of it, 110% of it, is totally devoid of any economic measure. It, it is all about, and you know, for somebody who had no economic measures, we, I had like negative economic, we lived on borrowed money, we lived on borrowed everything, right? We lived on the handouts and the grace of, you know, of strangers when I was growing up and the state who provided us with all kinds of you know, food assistance, you know, et cetera. So I thought that when I got money, I would think it's really a big deal. It's a huge deal. And early on, fortunately, I realized that there was a, a, there's a level that above which is nice to have but unnecessary. And then above, there's a level above that that it's literally total, it's almost meaningless, right? It happens quicker than you think. And what happens is people don't, by the way, it happens quicker than you think, and people try to dampen that feeling out, that yeah, I'm happy without it, and I'm, I'm kind of accomplished with, I have great kids, they are independent, they are well-meaning and well-doing, and they're happy. I mean, we kind of all sit around and we kind of hang out, and we have a good family, and that's pretty cool. And the first time you run into something, and by the way, we live in a great place, we, 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 we have all the benefits that money gives you, but we would be at half the money and a half of that again and half of that again. We would still be happy. And, my, and, I, and I'll play the other thing forward, people who have a whole lot of stuff and just totally dysfunctional families spend all of their time, all of their energy, all of their money plus, which can't buy it for them, to try to get order there. And I just say, don't, don't shortchange, don't shortchange the things that are really important that you think will come later. They don't come later if you don't build it. And don't overemphasize the things that, you know, when you get there, you go, okay, fine. <laughs> so, so we're here, so we're, now what next, right? You got, you got the Maserati or whatever it is. I don't have a Maserati, but if you got a Maserati and you say, what, am I going to get the second Maserati? So you read some of this stuff, right? The people have, to really? 
You can't, why do you need them? Because the reason why you do it is because you can and it gives no joy to you, right? So it's just a continued, um, almost biding time by crossing off days. And that's what I, I just hope that we get back to raising families, people, including university educations, post, so post-secondary, so universities, postgraduate educations, everything, that has something to do with caring for each other and laying a foundation that is not measured by how big the place you live in and how many of the things you have are. That can't be the measure, because then you, it is a zero-sum game. Because then what you do is you try to hoard everything, and there will be a huge amount of people who have nothing. And that's not, the, you know, we know what that ends up. You know, you, we see societies like that today where it's not that safe. I'm preaching, but it's, it's so important to me that we, that somebody who had nothing to somebody who has everything today, that everything is all about non-monetary stuff. Reasonable, organized life, reasonably good kids who are doing reasonably good things, a reasonable husband, you know, reasonable family members living in a reasonable community. This is good. This is good. So. Okay. All right. Questions from the audience? I'd love to hear a little bit about what motivates you in terms of some kind of the extracurricular nonprofit enterprise education. How do you think those problems? What are the kind of core motivations for you? It's a great question. It's a great question. Yeah. I get asked to do a lot of things, and in the beginning, I, I, I was pleased to try everything. But you know, one of the things I say now, and I thought a lot about this, so you know, how do you focus your energies, is that I ended up in a place that I think was the opening door for my entire life because of two things. One is I had a great mother, so a great structured structure and a person who could teach me some values. It could have been anybody, a priest, but it happened to be my mother. And the second is I lucked into engineering. I lucked into engineering, literally lucked into it. I had never heard of a friggin' engineer when I was going. I went to a Catholic school, all girl, Catholic school. And my senior year, I had four classes. One was belief in Jesus. <laughs> it was really, it was really. Uh, the second class was called leaving, cleaving, and becoming oneself. It was a marriage a class and how to be a good, and then some other class. And then I had a, a physics class. And I actually liked the physics class. The other classes were interesting. I took some English stuff. They were interesting, and I was really interested in this other set of classes. And I did a lot of investigation and real, by myself, going to the library and realized that you know, we were really poor. So one of the things that I was trying to do is find a job after four years of college, because my mother, had, there was no choice. You had to go to college. Even if you went for four years and just sat in the friggin' cafeteria, <laughs> she said, you're leaving this house and you're going to college, and we'll figure out a way to pay for it. So I had to go to college, and so I, I went to college, and I actually looked, before I went to college, I looked for what careers could you have after four years that made the most money. Literally, there's a book called The Baron's Book. You had to go to the library because you couldn't, there, couldn't, there wasn't Google there. There wasn't even personal computers. I still had the TI, you know, <laughs> the TI-10, remember that? The reverse polis notation calculators. Um, and I went, and it was chemical engineering. You can make the most money after four years of, of college if you became a chemical engineer. I said, that's what I'm going to become. I had no idea what the hell a chemical engineer was. <laughs> I, I really didn't. So I actually applied to all these schools, took all these tests, and you know, applied to all these schools, and got into a, some, a lot of the schools, just about all of them. And with, with a proviso that there would be help, I was led in on this thing called HEOP, the Higher Education Opportunity Program. It's for people who show promise but are not prepared. So you go to the college, and in the first year of college, you take all these remedial classes, and you get tutored, and you know, so on and so on. And then by the time you finish the first year of college, you actually are in the first year of college. And I actually did that. I, went, I, went to, I chose a school close to my home in, in chemical engineering. I hated chemical engineering. Really hated chemistry. You know, the thing about chemical engineering is you have to like chemistry. I kind of forgot about that part. <laughs> Because I didn't really like chemistry, but I was really good at physics, and I really and so instead of just dropping out of school, my advisor said mechanical engineering is the thing that. And it, I turned out it turned out I was a good student, very very good student, really quick learner. So all of the stuff that you had to do to lose the year, I didn't do. I you know got. 
Now, how, that's, you want to talk about luck? Go into the thing and make the most money, and so on and so on, chemical engineering. And I didn't hear about engineers. I got passionate about, so if, if that's what, if that kind of crooked path is how I got there with a mother who, with someone who was patient enough and forceful enough to keep me on the path, how do we make it so not happenstance for other people? How do we make it such that other people actually don't have to have these, you know, all the stars aligned with these unbelievably superstar, you know, mothers? Or how do we make it more natural for people to actually understand their choices? And that's what most of my activities, most of my philanthropic activities, 95% of them, are around this. How do we give people insight and more access to options? options that can improve their life. By the way, and if people think all I want is people to become engineers. So my son is getting his PhD in earth sciences, petroleum engineering from Stanford University. He's an MIT boy. And so people say, you must love him madly. So of course I do. But my daughter got her undergraduate degree in math and creative writing, and he's getting her, she's getting her master's degree in guess what? Creative writing. And by the way, I couldn't care less whether or not she chose math or creative writing. She understood options, and she picked the one that's best for her. And we have so many people, the vast majority of underrepresented minorities and women in this country, listen to that, half the population, women, and then another 30% of the population literally has no idea that they can actually become engineers and have a great life. They have no idea. And so why is that? I mean, we, we tell them how to dance and play basketball and everything you can imagine, right? So why is it that they're, and they're we, don't, we don't get out there and talk to them. We don't actually show them what, what we do. We don't inspire them. And that's what, what I want to do is actually do that. You know, people know every bit, starting basketball player for Duke. I guarantee you the kids in this, in this community do. Go to the school and ask them if they know who won the Nobel Prize in physics or who cured whatever the thing that was cured, they will have no clue. I just want to, I, it's never going to match, right? Because Duke is on TV all the time and they're pretty good and, and so, <laughs> but, but they should at least have a level of curiosity and ability to kind of connect the dots and right now that doesn't exist. So I think if my story, which is this supernatural story, people are like, oh my God, it's so amazing. How do we make it less amazing? How do we make it more ordinary? That's what the, the whole goal is, give them access. By the way, if they don't take advantage of it and they, don't, they fail, okay, we'll lose some. But right now we lose many, most, because they don't even know. They don't even try. Hi. Um, so you talked about how you picked mechanical engineering, or first chemical engineering, but you became a mechanical engineer because you wanted uh, to earn a lot of money after graduation. When did that change? As soon as I learned, earned, so, so I, for me, a lot of money. My first job, I was paid $29,004. I got a job offer from Xerox. I will never forget the sum. I had gotten my master's degree, BS, MS. I went straight through to get my master's degree. And they offered me a permanent job at $29,004. That was when I had made enough money. Literally, I could not believe that I was going to be paid $29,000 to do anything. And so I, and I literally was more than capable in living, living with far less than $29,004. So even net of taxes. So, so I thought at that point, like, wow, wow, people pay that much money for you to do this thing, which is pretty cool. It's fun. It's, they give you stuff to work with. They give you equipment. They fly you to places to to go visit other plants and do work in other places. You get to see the world. I thought this was the most amazing value proposition in the world. By the way, this was before the internet. So you couldn't find, you know, in order to see England, you had to go to England. <laughs> <laughs> now you can see it on TV, and people actually think that they've been there. So I learned that early. And what I had a whole bunch of experiences throughout my career that, that continually recalibrated me down to what was really important. So first was my first job. I said, wow, this is amazing, a lot of money, a lot more than I needed, because I was living on significantly less than that. And then when my mother got sick and died, that was the second point. By that time, I was making, let's say, $100,000, which is unheard of. 
it was 1983, so maybe $75,000. And I had more money than I needed, and with all of the money, I could not rescue my mother. I couldn't change that outcome. And the most important thing would have been to change that outcome, and I realized really quickly that, okay, what's this gonna buy you? It's gonna buy you, I don't know, the ability to get back and forth and see her more often, you know, right before she dies, but it wasn't gonna fix her. And that, probably because of the way I was raised, was very, very important. It, I realized it really early. And then the last time was just recently, my husband got very, very ill and nearly died. I remember sitting, I'm the CEO of a company. I'm sitting in, my, mother, my husband calls, somebody calls, and says, your husband is in the hospital, I fly, this is the part that money helps you on, you just, it doesn't matter, just fly to the place, it doesn't matter what the fear is, you just get there. I remember walking into the hospital room and my husband was, my husband is this, um, he's a different kind of a guy, but he's extremely powerful in his way, you know, in, in his way and his impact on our family. He's totally intellectual, he's very disorganized, so when you saw him, you wouldn't think that he was this, this uh, earth mover, but he is in our family. He has lots of faults, and, but, <laughs> <laughs> but he's great, and, and, and we love him, and he's 20 years older than I am, and he was really, really ill, and I remember then, calling one of my board members and saying that I'm not going to be able to deal with this. I'm not going to be able to deal with this. And the person said to me, first of all, God doesn't give you any more than you can deal with at any given time. He doesn't give you any more, so you'll be able to deal with it. And make sure that you keep falling back on the things that carry you through everything. Think about those things. And, he, and he, every day he called me, this board member, and said, have you thought about those things? What's important? What's important? What's important? And the thing that was important then was that I kept close to my husband physically so that he could see, so that he could feel the strength and that I was his hope. That was it. And it had nothing to do with money. It had nothing to do, it never came up, it didn't, you know. And so I, those are, I, I get reminded about this as you go through life. And, and it generally is when you asked earlier about joy and sadness and stuff, and it sounds kind of um, unemotional that I don't have this massive, the joys are not generally about, about the, they're about things that are, that if they, le if they changed, if they left you, you would be, it would take a long time for you to overcome them and fix them. And that's generally emotional things and people things for me. So I learned that, I, I keep getting reminded, right when my head gets a little bit too big and I you know, go to spend a little bit too much money and not give enough of it away, I get reminded, ah, come back down to earth, Ursula. You know, it's not about that. It's not about that. It's not about that. It's more about this. So. I apologize for your money. I'm trying. We got to do one more. So she did it. She, okay. right? Okay. I always do this. We, I say one more, so we're going to do two more. We're going to do yours, and then one more, and then we'll done. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> I always. I'm just doing it for that. <laughs> I create, I create havoc for Beth every time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. So given uh, the impact that your mother has had on you and how close you are with your children, uh, what is the legacy you hope to leave with them or the key lessons that you hope that they carry on? That um, effort is important. That good matters. And that good is not confusing. It's pretty clear. And that... My mother said this, this is another one of her statements. It's, um, you have to leave behind more than you take away. She said it to me throughout my whole life. Leave behind more than you take away. You do that in the company, you do that in relationships. And by the way, if you have relationships where you can't do that, don't have the relationships. That's all. I mean, you can be, I say this to my kids all the time, you can be a bad person all by yourself. There's no need to spread it all down, right? <laughs> so. Leave behind more than you take away is this big thing. And for kids of parents with means, it's really, particularly parents with means who came from parents without means, it's kind of a really it's a, a confusing place, right? Because, you know, we're trying to raise them like we have absolutely no money. You know, oh, you can't have a car. Car. People have cars. When they're 16 and 17, I'm like, there is no way in the world you're getting a car. I had a car when I was 25. And it was a broken down jalopy. And these kids that he's going to school with are driving these new cars. And I remember one of my mentors, Ann Mulcahy, said to me, you're trying to raise your kids 
like you're poor. You're not. You have to raise them as rich, as good rich kids. And, what, and it was an interesting statement. Because she said the values that you're trying to impart on your kids, they're going to know immediately if you go to the, to, to the Bahamas and stay at the Four Seasons. They're going to probably realize that this is not where everybody stays. So there's this kind of confusing thing. And she said, don't confuse them. Make it really clear. So raise them as good rich kids. So leave behind more than you take away is the one thing. And by the way, these kids are struggling. They're struggling because they are, the expectation for them, for them from our family is high. And it's not, and it's high in this kind of amorphous, be good people way. It's kind of hard, you know, so it's like, I want you to be good people. So they're looking around all the time, I hope I'm being a good person. But it's, it's kind of, I think it's okay. It's kind of the normal Catholic way, like, the, you know, Jewish people suffer, black people, uh, black people suffer, Christians suffer. We actually like to, you know, beat ourselves up and feel uncomfortable all the time. Like, <laughs> that's, what, that's what we do. I'm a, good Catholic, I'm a good Catholic girl, and I want my kids to be good Catholic kids, struggling. Last question. The question is, um, coming from a background where your parents did not work in corporate America, they weren't able to provide you with that guidance, how did you grow comfortable navigating that environment and dealing with the intricacies that you didn't even know existed when you got there? Yeah, I think that I was, um, most of the answers to questions like this, I, it sounds flip. It sounds like, you know, and it's not meant to be that way. It's not that complicated. I think we overthink a lot. We are almost too smart for our own good. One of the things that I learned early is that I am who I am. And I know what I know, and I'm willing to learn more every day, but you know, I, I am who I am. I, it's not like I can become somebody else. There are certain things that I know and things that I don't know. And so I approach most things like, hey, you know, I am who I am. I, my mother didn't work in corporate America. My father wasn't even around. By the way, most people in, in my generation's mothers and fathers, you know, they were, didn't work in corporate America. I mean, so it's normal. We actually believe it's more complicated than that. You just walk in with your best game, whatever that game is, right? And generally, it's your education. It's the best game you have. And yeah, you know, I mean, you guys are going to you going to the Fuqua School, uh, Duke. I mean, really. You walk in with that credential, that's what you have. And you, you don't have to cover, you don't have to, you have that, a lot of people don't. They may have some father or mother who worked in corporate America, you don't. It all normalizes itself, so it, it's just normal life. You wake up every single day, you use your best hand, the hand is dealt with you, you make it the best hand, you actually stay focused on areas that you can improve, you have some fun, joy, I mean literally, you have some fun, you find people that you like, you learn things, you go to work and you do good. And then you start moving, you don't get pigeonholed, I got asked about that earlier. No, that's not the way it is, it's just, it's just a part of life. Just like you live your life every day with your family, you should actually approach work that way. I make mistakes, I learn, I engage, I engage with people. And I, there is not a, like a chessboard with a master manipulator and saying, well, that person doesn't have, not, it doesn't happen. Everybody walks in with some, there are 10 cards that everybody should have. Most people walk in with four or five. They may have a different four or five than you, but okay, so you have your four or five, they have their four or five. And it's not that kind of a competition where, oh my God, I'm gonna, it's not that way. Most of the time it's just go to work, do good work, Learn, expand yourself, find a place that you like, you know, use the time that you have to experiment. This is it, you know, try things, move around, have fun, take risks. All through your life take risks, but you can take bigger ones when you have less people depending on you than when, than when you're not. And just kind of have a, a normal day and not try to be so prescriptive about I, this and that and I have to be prepared for this and that and I don't have this experience or that experience. It comes. It comes. One thing I told the lunch, and then I'm definitely over, is that most people think that corporations, a lot of people think that corporations want to weed out employees. It's the farthest thing, I mean, we want to find these bad guys and get them out. We, hide, we go through a ton of time interviewing, screening, training, um, doing personality tests now, you know, drug testing. Because we don't want to, we, we want you to walk in and be successful. <laughs> it is a disaster. 
even if you hire, if we hire you and you're not successful. So you should walk into a company, big, small, not for profit, for profit, government, whatever, with the idea that there's all these people who are rooting for your success because your failure is a really big deal for a company. And most people actually think that there's something else happening, that they're trying to find some gap. They, if they are, they're trying to find a gap and actually help you fill it, not trying to find a gap so that it can throw you out. And it's, it's, it's approach it from that perspective. They're trying to find a gap. You are trying to find a gap so that you can learn. Right? So that you can say, okay, I don't know. How do I learn? Somebody can come in and help me, et cetera. It's all upside. It's all upside, and we should play it that way. That's the hands that we're dealt. And particularly if you're sitting in this room, the hand that you're dealt is upside. You should walk out of this room and say, my god, I have upside hand. Let's go. Let's find a great company that wants me to come work. Let me find out things. Use the things that I know. Do it really well. Be really good at that. And I'm a, there's a whole bunch of stuff I don't know. I'm willing to learn. Guys, I'm willing to learn. And, that, and, that's, and if you do that, it generally is pretty good. Thank you. Thank you.